Whoa. <laughs> Hopefully that's not PG&E, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, turn off, turn off seat. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I got the go signal. Um, the, the Loma Prieta earthquake occurred uh, about 60 miles south of San Francisco. So the, those images we were looking at were actually kind of unusual damage in terms of the distance from the, the earthquake. It uh, ruptured about 11 miles down and about 25 miles of fault. And um, those three sites, the Cypress Viaduct, the Bay Bridge, and the Marina District, uh, were really pretty unlucky because it, Three things happened with, during the earthquake that sort of amplified the ground motion. One of them was when the fault ruptured, it was what we call a bilateral rupture. It ruptured in the middle and then propagated off in both directions. And I'll, I'll sort of trace it out with the arrow. Uh, this side moved this way, and it sent a lot of seismic energy rather than dispersing it to uh, uh, San Francisco. The other problem is the a lot of our areas uh, and the marina district is one, are built on soft soils. These amplify ground motion. So once these waves got into those soft soils, it shook a little, little bit harder. And then another thing that was a little unusual, but uh, not unheard of, is the seismic waves bounced off layers in the crust and they actually amplified themselves. Uh, um, so we, we had these sort of a trifecta that uh, worked against uh, San Francisco. In the end, about uh, 63 people were killed. Uh, Two-thirds of them in the viaduct uh, structure collapse. Um, about 3,800 people were injured, and about 12,000 people were displaced. And uh, increasingly, we're beginning to realize that one of the major problems with earthquakes is people being displaced from their homes. It's, uh, it, it becomes a, a challenging responsibility for, for earthquake mitigation. Well, Loma Prieta actually left us with quite a few legacies, and our speakers tonight will be talking about uh, um, s some of these. Um, probably the most important one was Loma Prieta was the first uh, large earthquake since the 1906 earthquake to strike the Bay Area. And so what it did was it sort of educated a whole, well, probably two or three generations <laughs> to the reality of the earthquake threat. I mean, we sort of knew about it because of 1906, but as, uh, with many disasters, as time passes, they don't seem uh, as serious. Uh, but Loma Prieta educated us. The second thing that happened, and Dave Schwartz will be talking about uh, this in his, his talk, is that we began to develop, uh, the scientists began to develop uh, ways of estimating probabilities of earthquakes. And uh, we had a substantial uh, pro probability in the Bay Area. So that not only did we see an earthquake, but we had the scientists telling us this, this is actually a, a serious problem. And so Loma Prieta sort of became the uh, poster child for, for that. Um, the second thing, and I sort of alluded to it when I talked about the seismic waves, is that the it really educated us to the complexity of earthquake uh, shaking. And Anne Marie is going to be talking about some of the things we've learned and how we're dealing with that uh, complexity. And then uh, finally, Loma Prieta uh, led to improved building codes uh, because we hadn't really had, other than the um, San Fernando Valley earthquake in uh, Southern California in 771, we hadn't had a good urban earthquake to, uh, to, to, sh to shake us up, so to speak. And uh, finally, the last thing is important. One of the things that happened in the Marina District was, um, I can't tell you how many times I heard people saying, why weren't we warned about this? And so Willie Brown, who uh, was the, in the state legislature at the time and represented the Marina District, introduced legisla legislation called the Seismic Hazard Ma Mapping Act. And one of the th things that had happened uh, in the preceding time was we had learned how to map these areas, uh, liquefaction areas where the ground loses its strength and uh, structures can um, just sink, in this case, a car. And uh, seismic landslides, this is Highway 17, which was actually closed after the uh, earthquake because of the, uh, the landslide. We can map those 
And so it was legislated that the California Geological Survey do this for the urban areas in California. And so today, if you buy property with this one of these uh, hazards, it'll actually be disclosed. And this, this sort of finished the uh, sort of the land deformation problem, if you will, because surface faulting had been uh, mapped starting in 1972. So uh, all of the things that can really uh, destroy a home other than shaking, uh, which, which is actually the most serious threat, uh, uh, now are, are part of the, the disclosure when you buy a home. Uh, the, the, the last slide shows the, the tremendous mitigation effort that's gone on in the Bay Area in the 30 years. I had a colleague, uh, Tom Broker, who with, along with some colleagues um, compiled these. Um, and ab about uh, 73 to $80 billion has been spent just uh, uh, strengthening structures and upgrading things. And if you look at the, the what pie chart, you can see uh, about uh, half of it is um, uh, lifelines, transportation, water, uh, there's some uh, electric gas, and th th that kind of thing. And then the other half are critical facilities, things like hospitals and, and schools. The other interesting thing is when you look at where this uh, money is being spent, you can see most of it is being spent in the, the, the nor northern Bay Area. Here's the Bay Bridge, San Francisco County, Alameda County, and most of these counties are uh, northern counties. So that uh, it's kind of interesting here, the earthquake was down near Santa Cruz, uh, and uh, yet most, most of the uh, mitigation money has actually been spent in the, in the northern uh, Bay Area. And I did neglect to mention, in my reference to Santa Cruz reminding, Santa Cruz was an interesting situation after the earthquake because it predated cell phones and the internet. And so there was little, um, uh, attention paid to Santa Cruz. They, they were having trouble getting the word out. And so it took several days before the emergency uh, uh, response people really began to focus on, uh, on, on Santa Cruz. And uh, I think Anne Marie will talk a little bit about some of what we've done to ad address that problem. Well, I'd like to now introduce our uh, three speakers. Uh, Dave Schwartz is a um, a geologist emeritus, and he's going to be talking about the faulting geology and the probabilities. And uh, Marie is a um, seismologist. She'll be talking about ground shaking. And uh, Jessica Murray is a geodesist uh, who's going to be talking about uh, the, the advances in terms of measuring the crustal thing, the crust, crustal movements. And in a sense, all of you are geodesists now because if you hold up your cell phone, you have a GPS in it. So you're able to locate yourself um, almost as well as Je Jessica can. She, she can do a little better job, but uh, it's become a very important tool uh, in geodesy in terms of looking at crustal de deformation. So Dave, you want to take the helm? Let's see if I can get you started here. There we go. Oh, I guess we have to launch you. Yes. Uh, yeah, just gonna... Is that good? All right. Well, thank you, Tom, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, I'm a geologist, and I was around for uh, Loma Prieta, and what I'd like to do tonight is tell you a little bit about what happened geologically and what we've done geologically uh, in the 30 years since Loma Prieta, what we've learned, um, and talk a little bit about earthquake probabilities. Uh, we live in the boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate, and those two plates are sliding past each other at about 40 uh, millimeters a year. It doesn't sound like very much, but in time it builds up. And um, there's a real balance here. Uh, what goes in in terms of this plate boundary stress squeezing the region has to come out. And it comes out as co-seismic slip on faults. 
Sometimes there's after slip on a fault after the big earthquake. Sometimes faults creep, and you'll hear about that from, from Jessica, and it means they kind of move slowly all the time. And sometimes the fault never reaches the surface. It's called the blind fault, but it might fold the crust above it. So you have all of these different things going on, and one of our goals is to solve the mystery of the, of the plate boundary. Uh, and we want to know, are there earthquake cycles? Do things occur in clusters? Are there periods when it's quiet? Um, and how regular or variable is this, is this behavior? Is it, is it mostly random, or uh, is there something more systematic there? So, um, you know, we really haven't learned everything in the last 30 years, and uh, there were geologists way back who uh, appreciated false, and the map on the left is from the uh, Lawson Report, which was published after the 1906 earthquake, and at that time, the San Andreas Fault was known, uh, part of the San Gregorio Fault had been mapped, the Hayward Fault was known, part of the uh, Central Calaveras was on the map, and part of the uh, Green Valley Fault had been mapped, and on the right is uh, just a pre-19... 89 fault map showing the major structures, and we've learned a lot, and we've added more faults, but they did know things back in 1906. So, <clears throat> when the earthquake occurred, um, I'm, I'm a big A's fan, so I had left the survey early and went home to watch the game in Walnut Creek. Uh, where we were living at the time, and uh, I poured a big glass of Zinfandel and put my feet up on the kitchen table, and uh, then you saw what happened with the uh, TV screen, and I said, damn, and you know, the game was called off. But what I really was curious about was what fault had produced this earthquake. I was sitting there, and I just felt the house move. It was the P wave coming in, hitting the house. I knew the earthquake was large, that it occurred somewhere to the south, but I didn't really know where. And it was very hard to communicate with Menlo Park um, uh, because the bridges were closed for inspection. I couldn't make it down the next day. Uh, heavy traffic. So it was like two and a half days before I made it down here. And I was crazy because I just wanted to go out in the field and look for the rupture on the San Andreas Fault. So, in the interim, geologists here who had actually mapped the fault in the 1970s went out, and they went to their favorite areas where they expected to see rupture and uh, fault features. Uh, in 1906 at Woodside, uh, this fence had been offset. Uh, at this location called Bovet Ranch, you can see what the rupture looked like on the ground. And then uh, up on Page Mill Road, um, this was the rupture from 1906. And the reports that came back from the field were, well, we got out there, but where's the rupture? And um, what they did see, well, when I finally got here, Tom Holzer was sort of running the show. We had a big meeting, and somebody said, we're getting reports that on Summit Road, up in the Santa Cruz Mountains, there are big cracks all over. So we said, okay. So we sent people up, and this is what they saw. Um, cracks, 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 and this is a map showing the distribution of these cracks, but this is not the San Andreas Fault. The San Andreas Fault is this red line. So what was, what was going on? Uh, in addition to uh, not, not seeing the fault, some other features were observed. Uh, but before that, I'll just point out this block diagram. And this is the San Andreas Fault at the surface. These red lines are that zone of ground cracking, uh, probably a result of strong shaking. Um, and the rupture, as Tom pointed out, went from about uh, 18 or 20 kilometers below the surface up to about 7 kilometers. It didn't get any higher. So this is one of those blind faults. And um, Bob McLaughlin and uh, his group, mapping group, 
spent a lot of time mapping here. This is one of their cross sections. Here's the San Andreas Fault. And you can see the whole series of thrust faults extending out to the east side of the San Andreas. And uh, along one of those, the uh, Monta Vista Shannon, uh, they observed a series of compressional features, little thrust faults, little folds. And what this represented was triggered slip. These, this was not connected to any sort of fault at depth, but shaking that had come through or was able to trigger movement, near surface movement, uh, on these faults. And right now, trigger slip is turning out to be a very important component in uh, a hazard, hazard analysis. So this was a really, really interesting earthquake. It was completely different from anything that anyone really expected to happen in the Santa Cruz Mountains. All right. This is... Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the paleo seismology that we've that we've done since. And paleo seismology is the study of past earthquakes. Uh, we tried to develop information on recurrence uh, of uh, ruptures. We try and pull out information on how much the fault moved when it slipped in the past. Uh, we try to get rates of slip on the faults. And we do this largely by excavating trenches, mapping the walls. And from this, we can estimate past magnitude and rupture length of earthquakes. We can use this to est estimate earthquake probabilities, which I'll talk about. Um, we we're really thinking seriously about temporal variations uh, in earthquake occurrence uh, over time, over 200 years, over 600 years in a region. How does the rate of earthquake activity vary? And uh, this in information provides us with sources for the strong ground motion that uh, Anne-Marie will talk about. So. This is a little timeline, 1906, the faults that had been mapped, uh, which are big ones for the plate boundary. Uh, it wasn't until the late 1960s that the first trenches were actually excavated, and they were excavated just to define where the fault was. That was, that was all people were thinking about at the time. There may have been a few trenches between 70 and 80, um, but the real work started as we approach Loma Prieta. And uh, I'll just say, when I was hired by the USGS in 1985, they said to me, David, we want you to work on the San Andreas Fault. I said, that's great, in Southern California. And uh, Southern California was the place that had had significant earthquakes, and that's where all of this uh, paleoseismic and earthquake geology work was being done by the group here in Menlo Park. Uh, we did start a little bit of work on the Rogers Creek Fault, then Loma Prieta occurred, and you can see the number of locations uh, that that have been developed, and there are more than I just I, that I didn't put on the slide. But Loma Prieta was a catalyst for changing the direction of where we were doing a lot of this work and focused it here in Northern California. So what have we gotten, gotten out of this? Well, I'd just like to show you an example, two examples of what we do. This is a trench that had been excavated right here. Uh, this is called the Thule Pond in Fremont. There were two traces of the Hayward Fault in red. This is BART. BART now has been extended to Warm Springs across the fault. Um, and this is some detail of the trench. And you can see these different layers represent deposits deposited in the, in the pond over time and uh, displaced by the faulting. And these red lines are traces of the fault. And they come up to a certain horizon, which had been an old ground surface. They're buried. Then the fault breaks higher. And it breaks higher. And it breaks higher. And in doing this, we can actually identify and date with radiocarbon uh, the timing of these past earthquakes. And at this location, we found evidence of 12 earthquakes on the Hayward Fault in about the last 
1,800 or so years, sort of an average repeat time of about 150, 160, plus or minus about 80 years, and the last major earthquake was in 1868, so uh, 151 years ago. But this is the type of work we do, and I'll show you one more site where we got a long record of ruptures. This is the San Andreas at a place called Vedanta, north of San Francisco. Uh, this is a, a, a map or log of the wall of the trench. These are traces of the fault coming up to different levels and then being buried and the fault breaking higher. And this right here is the San Andreas Fault. No dinosaurs jumping out, no houses falling in, this very, very narrow zone that typifies many major active faults. So, with this type of approach, we've uh, looked at the major faults in the Bay Area and the green dots of sites that we've investigated. And I think we have a pretty complete record of what's happened going back to about 1600 AD. And uh, this, these are three different models that we developed from our, our observations. Uh, and in each one, you can see that somewhere between the late 1600s and the late 1700s, all of the faults in the Bay Area had surface ruptures on them and produced obviously some type, type of large earthquake and we tried to estimate the magnitudes. Some people refer to this as a, um, oh, I would just call it an earthquake cluster, but a seismic storm I've heard mentioned uh, or an earthquake storm. And, um, and then in the 1800s, things were relatively quiet. Uh, 1868, the 1838 earthquake is problematic, so you might even take it away. And then we had 1906 in quiescence. So at least for 400 years, you can see there's some variability. And of course, we'd like to go much further back with this level of detail. Um, just for additional comparison, uh, this is a timeline. Uh, Historical earthquakes are shown as blue dots, and these are all earthquakes estimated to have magnitude of five and a half and larger. Uh, low, uh, 1906 occurred right here, and you can see in the 56 years before 1906, there were 39 earthquakes of five and a half and larger. In the 113 years following, 1906, there have only been 16. So 1906 had a very important effect. It really released the stress in the entire region, relaxed the falls, relaxed the crust. Um, and uh, we can put this together with this. And again, we're seeing variability in the rate of earthquake occurrence. So the question is then, what happens in the past? And uh, one of the things we've done is to try and model some of this, and uh, we've learned that faults interact with each other. When one fault moves, it, it can increase the stress on a neighbor, or it can decrease the stress on a neighbor. <clears throat> and using the timing of earthquakes in that cluster, Fred Pollitz uh, and I put together this little model, and we started it in 1690 with a certain level of, of stress. The cluster occurred, and by 1780, all of the faults except the peninsula of San Andreas had turned blue. It means they were relaxed. They had failed. Um, I'm being, um, being signal. I'm almost there. Um, by 19, at 1900, you can see that uh, the San Andreas has turned red hot. 1910, after the 1906 earthquake, the whole region in this model is relaxed. And then in 2010, the Hayward and the Rogers Creek are heating up. And um, this is what lies out ahead of us. So we started in 1988 to do earthquake probabilities. Uh, we broke the faults into sections or segments. We assigned magnitudes to them. Uh, we used whatever data we had, uh, and we uh, calculated 
30-year earthquake probabilities. And we needed average recurrence, we needed uncertainty in that, and we needed to know how much time had elapsed since the last big earthquake. Uh, then, this is 1988, uh, then Loma Prieta in 1989, we went back to the drawing boards and uh, we redid it, we added the Rogers Creek and the probability changed from 50% to 67%. We've done a series of these over the years. The most recent, uh, published in 2015, has the Bay Area at 72%. And you can see we have a much more complex system that we're working with than we started with in 1988. Uh, we have a lot of smaller faults, that are included, and this is what we have to look forward to. So I'm just going to conclude with this. The 89 earthquake was a catalyst for renewed study of the Bay Area Faults, a significantly improved general understanding of the location, style, and rate of rupture on components of the uh, region's fault system has emerged. And um, questions remain on the issues of how long ruptures can grow to be and how do faults interact. Longer paleoseismic histories can help shed light on this, as well as important questions of earthquake clustering and variations in the occurrence of large earthquakes over intervals of hundreds of years or, and longer. And what I think we need is a four-dimensional model of the Bay Area fault system which includes all of the physics and time. So I will leave it right there and turn it over to Anne Marie. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being here. And thanks, David, for um, getting us acquainted there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what happens once we sort of understand that the earthquakes are going to occur. So I'm a seismologist. I think about ground motions. That's the ground shaking. So what you feel or what structures or buildings experience during an earthquake. And um, particularly from Loma Prieta, we want to understand this because about 98% of the losses from that earthquake were due directly to ground shaking. So I like to ask questions like, how can we best model ground shaking um, to support the best building and development practices? So I'll just give you a quick caveat, though. Uh, in 1989, I was six years old in growing up in New York State. Um, so not only did I not feel this earthquake, I didn't have any recollection. I wasn't watching the World Series. I didn't care for baseball. <laughs> I still don't. Um, but I'm going to tell you sort of like my looking back on, on where I think um, our field has come since then and what we can look forward to. So no um, talk about ground shaking Loma Prieta is complete without showing um, a rupture model. This is from Brad Agard in 2008, so obviously developed after the earthquake. Um, this is a physics-based model. It's really a reconstruction of what we think happened based on how we understand um, the physics of earthquakes and the data that we collected during that. So um, this, just to orient you, right, so San Francisco is here in Oakland. We're looking at a sideways view of the Bay Area. Um, this is the epicenter near Santa Cruz, and this is the extent of sort of the extent of the fault that ruptured, which you'll see. And I also want to draw your attention to the clock here. The time will tick up. Um, the duration of the actual earthquake is about 10 seconds. So after 10 seconds has elapsed, the earthquake has kind of stopped happening, but the waves are going to continue to propagate for quite a while. And the colors that you'll see um, are related to the shaking intensity. So the, the oranges, reds, um, dark colors are the stronger shaking intensity. All right, so let's roll. So it takes a few seconds, then the earthquake comes up to the surface. Um, you can see that quickly the ground motions get very strong in the epicentral region there. Um, by now, the earthquake has actually stopped occurring, but the waves are now traveling away from the epicenter. Um, you can see this happens for quite a while, and we still have really strong ground motions quite a distance away from the epicenter. And we can see, make a, quite a few observations here. So obviously, like I said, we have strong ground motions here, but you can see a very heterogeneous pattern. Um, we see large ground motions occurring in sort of lobes, stretching all the way out to Livermore, particularly like in the Santa Clara Basin. And then as the waves continue to propagate, you can see, as um, Tom mentioned earlier, all around the bay here, we have these soft soils and some um, man-made fill. We're seeing amplifications of ground motions. Now, like I said, this was uh, built in 2008, so we didn't have um, this knowledge immediately. We didn't have this capability at the time, but it gives us a good idea of what happened during the event. 
So this is the USGS shake map. Um, this was also developed after the fact. This was the product itself was developed in 1999. It's now released for um, all significant earthquakes worldwide. Um, this is a sort of a snapshot of the largest ground motions that occurred. So we say it's the peak ground motions over that entire rupture, that movie we just saw. And again, you can see the same sort of features. Um, we have obviously large uh, ground motions near the epicentral region, but also in these other locations, basins, and along the bay where we had soft soil. So in particular, um, as Tom also mentioned, there was really strong shaking at the Cypress Viaduct of I-80 on the east span of the Bay Bridge. That was about 60 miles away from the epicenter, so it was fairly unusual to have such large damage at such a distance. Um, and that's due to the soft soils that were there that really amplified the shaking. So this is a plot of three seismograms that shows the actual ground motion recorded at those sites. Um, this is a bedrock site that's near to the viaduct, and you can see um, fairly small motions. Whereas this soft mud site and this uh, sand and gravel site that were very close to the structure, so much larger ground motions. So it's these amplified ground motions here um, that caused this structure to experience so much ground motion and to collapse. And um, we also see um, large ground motions in this basin structure. Um, and again, that's due to the soft soils that are trapped in that basin. You can also get increased shaking duration. So if you take a bowl of jello and you shake it, and then you stop, you don't touch it, the jello continues to shake for a little while. And that's very different than if you shook a rock and stopped touching the rock. It doesn't do anything. Um, so following the Loma Prieta earthquake, we um, collected a lot of these observations and um, really solidified our understanding of the heterogeneity, the spatial variability of ground motions, and the effect that these soft um, soils or artificial fills can have on local ground motions. This is a USG, USGS pager product. Um, so this was developed uh, in 2008, so it's fairly new. Um, I like to think of it as the shake map, so the shaking that occurred times the population um, and the vulnerability of that population, so the people in the structures. Um, it gives an estimated or modeled impact of fatalities and economic loss and gives the number of people exposed to levels of shaking. So this is one way that um, we can sort of get a quick estimate of the impact of the earthquake. So Tom mentioned that following 1989, we didn't really have a lot of information about what had happened in Santa Cruz. And we didn't have immediate um, cell phone connections or internet. So this would be one way to get an idea for um, responders that can aid in humanitarian or scientific response of the impact of the earthquake. So again, we didn't have these products or this information so rapidly in 1989, but um, now it's available in a few minutes. So after the South Napa earthquake, Shake Map came out in six minutes, and the Pager product would have come out right after that. So looking forward in the future, we'll continue to develop these products um, and put in you know, better models and understanding of ground shaking or soil condition to get, a much, um, to get a more accurate estimate of all of these numbers. I'll skip over this. So I want to talk a little bit on how we're um, developing and improving ground shaking models. So we talked um, about this. This is a snapshot from that movie I showed. Um, we sort of know this is what happens. This is sort of a reconstruction of what happened during the earthquake. Um, and it captures, like I mentioned, the spatial heterogeneity and variation um, in the ground motion. But this is just one single earthquake. Um, and we can sort of treat this as our observations. But what we want to be able to do um, and I'll show in a moment, is take sort of the information that David presented, so where are we likely to see an earthquake, and then estimate what would the ground motions be for a future earthquake that has not yet occurred. So when we do that, we're talking about predictive ground motion models. So we're not predicting occurrence, but once we understand that occurrence could happen, what would the typical ground motion be? Um, so that's modeling the average behavior of seismic waves um, with the distance away from a fault. So it's based on all of our collections of observations of, of earthquake ground shaking from all magnitudes and all distances of earthquakes. So on the right here, these dots are our are, are data, our are observations, but we're simply fitting that to a magnitude and a distance. So distance here is on the x-axis, and this would be the predicted shaking intensity, intensity from, say, a magnitude 6.9 earthquake. So we simply have this one curve. We translate that into map space. It just looks like these sort of concentric rings, so near the epicenter, very strong ground shaking, and as we move away, weaker and weaker ground shaking. But that certainly doesn't, in a predictive sense, reflect what we actually observe, which is this spatial variation and heterogeneity. Um, so the first sort of modern functional um, GMPEs were in the 1970s. Uh, it really hasn't changed that much since there. We'd have more data. We can refine these models a little better. But we're still dealing with basically 
a single curve for magnitude and distance. We do include more complex site information that came out of earthquakes like Loma Prieta, um, where we can put um, that complex soil structure in there or more complex source information. But what we'd like to be doing and what we're sort of working on now is doing location specific or individualized models um, that it can account for the spatial heterogeneity. So um, your, the shaking at your location that we predict might be, be different than um, your coworkers, which is a mile or two down the road. Um, but we gonna, are gonna get you a more accurate um, prediction of that. So we take that kind of ground motion models, uh, we combine it with our fault probabilities. Uh, you saw this once with David, I think you'll see it again a few more times tonight. Um, and we can combine that information together. So if we have an earthquake, say, that occurs on the Hayward Fault, we can estimate what the magnitude might be, put that into a relation like this, um, and then do that for every earthquake um, that has a recurrence rate as well. And we get a map that looks something like this, which is a level of ground motion, so the color is the ground motion, that's likely to be exceeded in a given time period. Um, so this is, for example, a map is 2% chance of exceedance of this color ground motion, again, that's that shaking intensity, over the next, or over 50 years. Um, so now this can give you an idea of, of how to do uh, building codes or development. So in uh, 1976 was the first USGS shake map. Um, it took into account historic seismicity and basic fault geometry, like what David had described um, from pre-Loma Prieta. Current shake maps were developed in 1996, standardized the methodology. Um, these are now used in building codes, and they have uh, more complex uh, logic in there, um, soil conditions, they take into account fault slip rates. But again, in the future, we're gonna move towards these more um, specific source path site, including basin information and putting in more complex slip rate models. And that information is all put into building codes. Um, so since 1989, we've really improved the building codes by incorporating information um, about these soft soil sites. So it was really Loma Prieta that sort of put us just over the edge to make these changes. Uh, current U.S. building codes do a, a really good job at preventing loss of life. So where we're looking in the future is to um, improve our resilience. That's minimizing uh, impact and minimizing downtime. Um, so thinking about this sort of um, timeline here of going from maybe something's fully operational, it means you can um, re-inhabit it today or versus total collapse or something has to be rebuilt. But thinking about this as more of a spectrum. So performance-based design um, thinks about what's the, how should a building, based on its use, how should a building perform under certain conditions, and then how can we best design for that. So a, a hospital, maybe you really want to prevent any kind of damage at all, it's for, critical for life safety, but for Joe's bar, um, maybe, you know, you can have a little bit of damage and patrons can still come in. <laughs> so I want to just touch quickly on earthquake early warning. This is the USGS Shake Alert project. So the idea here is that an earthquake has started. Um, but we can quickly detect and locate that earthquake with our sensors. And then we want to get the alert out ahead of those earthquake waves. So we can send information to a city um, faster than the seismic wave travel, because electromagnetic information waves travel faster than seismic waves. So that gives us some lead time. We can let you know before the shaking arrives at your location. So the current challenge is to do this everywhere and alert everyone as fast and accurately as possible. So questions we're asking are, for example, how much ground shaking will any one person feel at any one location? So it's actually really fun to think about this um, in the context of Loma Prieta, because we had um, sort of the first operational um, temporary early warning system for the aftershocks. So this is a map showing the epicentral region, and these are all the aftershocks that occurred. We already knew that at the Cypress Viaduct structure here in Oakland, we knew that there was strong soil amplification. So we knew that we could expect stronger ground motion um, at that location from aftershocks. And there was ongoing demolition work at that viaduct. Um, so receivers near the sources, near the epicentral region, would detect earthquakes quickly and then send a radio signal to Caltrans that would um, let people know doing the demolition work um, to remove themselves from um, any dangerous locations. And they got about 20 seconds lead time for some of the larger aftershocks, which is um, quite remarkable. And the stats are, are pretty good for um, the number of events that they were alerted for. So back to our, our current project. Um, it's a USGS-led project in development for California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, alert delivery you can expect by apps. There's already some apps in Los Angeles. Um, and wireless emergency broadcast, so that's like Amber Alerts that you get directly to your cell phone. And we'll see public warnings, again, maybe to your cell phone, as well as automated systems. So BART, um, I think, is already receiving alerts, and they can slow their trains down. <laughs> 
but we can expect uh, seconds to tens of seconds of warning, um, depending on your level of, of ground motion that you're interested in. And we can also expect to see public rollout for California soon. So thinking about the future, this is sort of my ideal future. Um, we'd like to see more penetration into these automated systems. I mentioned BART, but maybe there's other applications, or some rote or routine actions that people can sort of get used to. So for example, in schools, every kid's get under desks automatically when they hear some siren. I'd like to see um, specific alerts for every location. So maybe your cell phone would know exactly where you are and what your soil or site conditions are and tailor your alert specifically to you. And that's actually really similar to what the Cypress Viaduct um, temporary system was doing. We knew what the amplification was at that site. We knew where we were expecting the earthquakes for. And so we were able to build this um, specific system. So I'll end there and turn it over to Jessica for geodetics. Okay, so uh, my name is Jessica Murray, and I'm going to be talking about how we're using geodetic data in our earthquake hazard assessments and earthquake response. <clears throat> As Tom pointed out at the beginning, um, you are probably already very familiar with at least some forms of geodetic data, specifically GPS. Um, and I'll talk a, a lot about GPS and some other types of data as well. And I'm going to um, start by discussing why these data are important for earthquake science um, in three contexts here. Um, the first of which is interseismic strain accumulation and how we use that to, um, to do seismic hazard assessment. So uh, we're living on a plate boundary here where the North American plate and the Pacific plate are moving past each other. And although the plates are always moving, um, we don't always have motion right at the plate boundary. Most of that relative motion is taken up during earthquakes, but those only happen occasionally. And in that time in between earthquakes, on either side of a fault, which would be represented by this line in, in the diagram here, um, the, the Earth's crust is really being warped um, because the far field motion of the plates is pulling on it, but um, there's no motion happening at the fault. And we can measure that strain in the Earth's crust. Uh, with geodetic um, techniques such as GPS and, uh, and other ones I'll describe. And that's important to know um, those rates of strain accumulation if we want to understand um, what the probability of earthquakes is on different faults. And we've already seen this image a, a couple times um, tonight and it's showing what the probabilities are for major faults in the Bay Area. Uh, another thing that's really exciting that geodetic data can do is to measure um, motion that is is blind to uh, that the seismometers are blind to because um, it, it doesn't generate seismic waves. So uh, a lot of faults in the Bay Area uh, actually exhibit a little bit of motion all the time called fault creep. And although it's at a very slow rate, we can measure it. And we can, in fact, even observe it visually if we wait long enough. So um, this, these figures here show a series of photographs of a curb in Hayward being offset by creep on the Hayward fault over time. Uh, fault creep can also cause visible cracking in pavement. And so if some of the um, stress due to plate motion is actually relieved by this very slow but steady motion that doesn't generate shaking, well, that, that's good. And that needs to be accounted for in seismic hazard assessment. Uh, another example of a seismic motion also observable using geodetic techniques is um, some continued motion on a fault after an earthquake happens. And these two photographs here show an example from the um, 2014 South Napa earthquake. So in the 24 hours following that event, um, cracks that had developed along the fault during the earthquake continue to show motion. And that's um, problematic for um, for emergency responders and for, for immediate reconstruction efforts. So when Caltrans was trying to fix the roads, but they continued to move, they had to keep coming back and fixing them again. And that's also difficult for homeowners who want to start um, repairing their properties. And finally, um, geodetic data can complement seismic data by also enabling us to measure um, fault slip during an earthquake. So when the earthquake finally does happen, this motion 
on the fault plane we call fault slip. The larger the slip, uh, the larger the magnitude of the earthquake. And we, we really would like to have a, an accurate magnitude estimate um, for no, a number of purposes, um, one of which I'll talk about it towards the end of my segment here is, is for earthquake early warning. And so geodetic data can help us there both by um, helping with accurate magnitude estimates and uh, understanding what the extent of rupture is on the fault. So at the time of Loma Prieta, um, what, what did we do in terms of geodetic measurements? Well, we didn't really have GPS yet. Uh, it was just in its infancy at that time. But um, the USGS had really pioneered uh, a program of trilateration measurements, which is a, a technique for measuring the distance between benchmarks. So um, this photograph here kind of gives you a sense of, of what was involved. Um, basically, we were able to measure the distances between benchmarks that were usually located on hilltops because you needed to have line of sight between um, stations that were being measured. And uh, the, the data were very precise. However, um, there were some drawbacks. They, this technique only provides line length change. Um, you, as I mentioned, you need line of sight. And as you can get an idea from this picture, it's, it's fairly labor intensive. So it's not something that could be done um, as frequently as we would have liked to. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, GPS was, was just getting started in the mid-1980s, and the USGS had a handful of sites shown here in red um, where we had begun to make GPS measurements. And those were actually very useful um, after the earthquake to, to get a better idea of, of what motion happened along the fault. And a lot more GPS data uh, were collected after Loma Prieta to study the post-seismic uh, deformation as well. And so uh, since then, GPS and more generally speaking global navigation satellite systems have really become uh, a major source of data uh, for earthquake studies. And this map here shows the, the distribution of permanent continuously <coughs> operating stations that are run by uh, a number of different agencies, some at universities, some government agencies and research consortia. Um, that all share data um, over the internet to, that record the motion of these locations. And uh, this is a photo that shows an example of what one of these sites might look like, and it happens to be this one down here. And um, because the data are continuously recorded, uh, you can not only measure the, the steady strain accumulation that I mentioned earlier, um, but also offsets that happen when earthquakes occur. and this um, time variable motion that can continue after an earthquake. So um, one example of uh, a data set that's, that's derived from the GPS observations is this velocity field for the Bay Area. So each vector here shows uh, how fast that location is moving relative to the stable interior of the continent. And uh, the blue ones are from these permanent uh, stations like the one I just showed, the green are for, from locations where we make occasional measurements. And what you can see is that relative to the stable interior of North America, um, these stations are moving um, increasingly fast uh, as you get closer to the Pacific Plate. And this kind of information uh, is now incorporated into our seismic hazard assessments. The uniform California earthquake rupture forecast was the first one to really formally and, and directly include slip rate data that was derived from geodetic observations. I uh, wanted to touch upon a couple of, of technological advances. Um, these are imaging techniques that are now very important for the kind of work that we do. Um, there are two that I'm mentioning here called INSAR and LIDAR. In both cases, they're um, using sensors to transmit and receive either radar or reflected light to measure the topography or the surroundings. And if you do that repeatedly for the same location, you can detect changes that have occurred between two observation times. And those changes in, in our context would be ground movement due to, for example, earthquakes, fault creep, or, or post-seismic motion. On the left is an example interferogram from the recent uh, Ridgecrest earthquake. And so what you're seeing here um, in the, the color shading is basically the movement of the ground surface 
um, due to that earthquake. Each cycle of colors represents 14 centimeters of, of movement in the, the direction um, from the ground to the satellite on which the sensor uh, was, is, is mounted. And so, um, so it's, it's very exciting to have such good spatial coverage. And what also is, um, is something new and, and also going to benefit us a lot is that the newer satellites that are being launched have more frequent repeat passes, so you can get more information about time varying processes. And there's a joint U.S.-India satellite mission um, that's planned for launch in 2022. That'll be the first uh, U.S. Um, participation in, in a satellite mission for, in, for INSAR for these purposes. Um, and then on the right, here's an image that's showing an example of LIDAR data. And um, LIDAR can be either airborne or ground-based. In this case, it's from a ground-based sensor. And what it's showing you is a, a bridge. You can kind of see that here in the image that's uh, built across the San Andreas Fault, which runs here in Parkfield, California. And you can see that uh, on the side of the, of the fault closer to us, the, the bridge is um, sort of a, a green color. And then on the opposite side, you can see that it's blue. And that color change is, is um, showing that there's actually movement along the fault. This was movement after an earthquake happened in 2004, um, some continued fault slip in the days and weeks following that event. And so, um, as I mentioned, these can, this kind of um, data can be collected in an airborne platform or ground-based and also in a mobile platform. So, um, USGS had <clears throat> Mobile, mobile laser scanning ability. Um, it, in this photo from the recent Ridgecrest earthquake, it's mounted on this truck here, and the, um, the crew is going out to take images of the fault rupture and um, try to measure continued motion there. And the last technological advance that I wanted to talk about in the geodetic um, realm is uh, high rate and real time GNSS measurements. So when I talk about high rate in the context of um, GNSS, we're talking about one to five samples per second. So that's basically um, one to five position estimates per second. And this enables you to directly measure ground displacement during an earthquake and, and track the passage of the seismic waves and any permanent offsets that are occurring as they happen, as the, the earthquake is evolving. And um, when those data are available in real time, that can be a very powerful tool. So um, this plot on the left shows an example of data from a high rate, uh, a number of high rate GPS stations in the vicinity of the um, Gorka earthquake, which happened in Nepal. So just to or orient you, we're talking about um, this region here. And the traces at the bottom are from the station closest to the rupture. Oops, pardon me. And uh, as you go to the top, you're moving farther away. And what you can see is that the, the signal arrives um, later and is of smaller amplitude at stations that are farther from the epicenter. And so we can use this peak ground displacement as a function of distance in a very similar way to uh, what Amory described using um, ground motions to infer what the magnitude of the earthquake is. And we, we can do that quite rapidly. We know that uh, for very large earthquakes, estimating the magnitude from seismic data alone in real time um, can be problematic and, and sometimes leads to an underestimate. So in the context of early warning and of predicting what the shaking will be at user locations, we really need to have as accurate a magnitude estimate as possible. So that's uh, an instance where this real-time GNSS data can become um, quite useful. And just to show one other example of that, Another um, way that we can use the real-time GNSS is to actually estimate the evolving fault slip as the earthquake is happening. And this um, figure is from a retrospective study of the 2011 um, Tohoku earthquake in Japan, which many of you um, may remember caused a very devastating tsunami. And so each of these vectors is showing a GPS station in how it moved during that earthquake. And the colored shading in the background is the, um, the estimated slip from these data uh, at, a, at a certain time snapshot, in this case, 180 seconds after the earthquake started. And on the right, what you're seeing is how the magnitude estimates from 
slip, um, slip estimates like this one compared to what was uh, determined from the seismic data. So the stars are showing the seismic estimates of magnitude, and these curves are showing various estimates from um, the GNSS data. So you can see that um, the GNSS data give you a more accurate magnitude estimate, and so if we can do that rapidly enough, that could be very um, important for improved early warning. So, uh, and I guess the last um, thing I wanted to mention about that is that this is, this is something that we are currently testing um, for possible inclusion in the Shakler early warning system. So, at this point, I think I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Tom. Okay, we're going to go back to cruising altitude for a couple minutes and then uh, we'll open the floor to questions. I need to get out of here. Okay, so how far have we come in, in 30 years? And I'm really going to just uh, summarize briefly what, um, if I can advance here. There we go. Um, Really, the, the scientific advances in the 30 years since Loma Prieta, and many of them triggered by uh, Loma Prieta, as you, as you heard, have, have been pretty impressive. We've learned a lot more about how faults uh, behave and interact, and uh, it, I think, has improved our ability to make these, uh, make these estimates of probability. Um, but at the same time, it, it's turning out there's a lot of complexity to it, so that we'll probably never be come up with a precise probability, we're going to be able to give you only the uncertainty or the range of, of, of values. Uh, we've learned how to do a better job of predicting ground shaking. Uh, it, as uh, you've seen, it's, it's actually a pretty complex subject when you can get down to the details. So when you're trying to forecast what an earthquake would do, you need uh, better tools. And we're, we're getting there in, in part because of what uh, Loma Prieta triggered in terms of the studies. Um, the technological advances in, in geodesy are, are very impressive in terms of helping us locate ourselves better in uh, both time and space. So we're able to uh, make measurements that we couldn't even dream of during the time of Loma Prieta. And as our speakers pointed out, these end up in USGS products. Uh, Loma Prieta served a very critical role, as I mentioned at the beginning, in terms of alerting us to the earthquake hazard in the Bay Area. It made it very real. And it led to very practical things, improved building codes, um, construction practices has gotten a lot better, and we're now zoning land in terms of, of the hazards. And coming back to the construction practice, I think as you just drive around the local area and look at a home being built these days, the amount of steel that very often goes into a a residence is really uh, pretty impressive. Um, I wanted to close on this note because I, I think it's an important change in the way we're approaching our natural disasters, how to reduce the, uh, the impact of them. And the conversation sort of started with Loma Prieta. Uh, at the time of Loma Prieta, uh, engineers and society were focused on reducing death and damage from, from earthquakes. But now, we, we try to build um, a resilient community. We want a community to be able to recover quickly from an earthquake, to become operational quickly. And I'm just going to illustrate what I mean by that in, with a real simple example. Um, some of you probably are familiar with Channing House. It's a senior uh, um, housing uh, facility in Palo Alto. There are hundreds of seniors in there. And uh, you've probably noticed after hurricanes how we always have a few stories of, of seniors who have been seriously impacted by uh, damage to their housing, and it really creates a, or can create a crisis situation. Well, Channing House was built in 1961, and we were still learning how to build uh, these high rises uh, to withstand earthquake shaking. And after Loma Prieta, they retained a consultant, a structural engineer, and uh, they decided they needed to improve the the seismic resistance of, of the building. And what they did was take advantage of the fact that uh, Channing House sits on a, um, a large parking, underground parking garage. And so they went to each one of the columns 
and basically inserted a large marsh marshmallow at the base of the column. And what that does is it basically stops the shaking from going into the building because the building has enough inertia, it just sits there. And so the building doesn't feel much of the earthquake. And uh, the, the marshmallow, of course, gets roasted pretty well. <laughs> but uh, it, it has been tested in several earthquakes and seems to work pretty well. And you can actually see evidence for that. If, if you happen to walk by uh, a Channing House sometime, you might just take a peek. Uh, the next picture will be where that ellipse is. And what you see is this um, steel grate. And it covers an open trench. And if you stop to think about it, with that underground parking structure, there's still walls and uh, um, supporting columns that are touching the external soil. So if you want to keep the earthquake away from the building, you actually have to take away some of the soil. So what this enables uh, Channing House to do is the, the ground can move outside of Channing House, but it's not going to come in contact with the building and shake it. And so, so you have a, a building that should be totally functional after, after an earthquake. Uh, you might have problems with electricity and water, but these are external to the, the building. We're going to have to count on uh, the Palo Alto utility system to provide that, that piece of the uh, resi resilient uh, com community. But nonetheless, what it does is it, it takes a, um, a, a home to hundreds of, of seniors and it uh, obviates a problem that uh, one would have if one didn't do this kind of thing. And that's what we mean by a resilient community. I wanted to close with this side slide, and it just summarizes what uh, Dave was showing you earlier. It puts the probabilities on the, uh, the major faults in the Bay Area. And you can see the uh, total probability for the Bay Area is about 72% in 30 years. So that's a pretty high probability of an earthquake, and it certainly drives a lot of the, uh, the, the resilience efforts that you, you now see in, in, the, in the Bay Area. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and we're going to do questions. And I'll ask our speakers to come up uh, to handle any questions that you have. And while they're coming up, I might mention, um, I, I had forgot to note that the speaker on November 21st is uh, Sean Vitasek, who's going to be talking about sea level rise, extreme water levels, and coastal erosion. How, how bad could it possibly be? So. A nice climate change topic. So, and I'll take the speaker. Um, and if you could come to the microphone as this young man is demonstrating. Hi, my name is Mike Green. I have a question for you. I'm interested in, I talked to Barbara from, I'm from San Jose, and I live near the Camden Community Center. I'm talking to Barbara. I'm thinking how uh, renting a geologist uh, for a bus trip to Napa to explore the uh, Napa Fault. Is it possible? Uh, we'd have to find a Napa specialist. <laughs> uh, maybe what you could do is um, come up afterwards and we, we might be able to give you some leads. So. Okay, thank you. Anyone have any other questions? Like, when's the next earthquake? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, Here, I, I'll carry the mic. Okay. Do I have to stand up? No. Okay. Hi. Thanks. Um, it was really, really great. I have a concern, though. Um, you know, with the immediate growth of Google and Apple, et cetera, in San Jose, Sunnyvale, et cetera, how are the, how can, how do they manage to get um, permits for so many buildings, and yet the transportation, the corridors are not going to be enlarged? So if there's an emergency, how do you evacuate so many people? You know, uh, also the concern like where the Apple spaceship is in Cupertino. Um, so there's a huge population, and it's uh, corporate and also residential. So um, the impact, I believe it's going to be completed in about five years. 
like the Google complex. So if somebody could address that. Yeah, I, I don't know that we're really the right folks to answer that. <laughs> But I'll just make the observation that after Loma Prieta, anybody who worked in the city and lived down here uh, had a problem uh, because it, it is difficult to keep the utilities, particularly the electricity, going. So that that means your transportation systems are usually impacted. Well, that's so because people work here and live up there. Uh, well, no, it'll be a pro it'll be a problem um, certainly in the short period after the earthquake. I will say, though, uh, after Loma Prieta, Loma Prieta prompted the largest investment in retrofitting bridges uh, of any earthquake in, in California's history. And so probably our transportation system is pretty robust. So it's, it's just going to be the, the problem of moving a lot of people at one time that's going to be the, the challenge there. And I think also since Loma Prieta, you know, our building practices and design codes have become more stringent, especially for these really large projects. We do those large projects, the tall buildings in San Francisco, you're talking about the Apple um, Center, have to undergo even stricter design and um, guidelines for, so they should be built to the best codes and, and withstand um, earthquake ground shaking. And that's a lot of what we're also talking about, that homes and hospitals and stuff will um, be resilient. So they might be a little bit damaged, but they're still totally functional. So that's really where we're our outlook for the Bay Area. In uh, 89, uh, the Marina District liquefied and all sorts of buildings were destroyed. Foster City, as far as I know, did not. Why was Foster City lucky? Uh, Foster City is built on a different kind of soil, a clay soil, and liquefaction occurs in sandy soils. And most of the liquefaction in the immediate Bay Area occurs uh, where they've dumped sand into the Bay. It's usually pretty old uh, uh, fill areas. Uh, and then the other place, of course, is uh, stream channels. So, for example, San Jose has a problem along many of the creeks. Uh, but Foster City, the, the question comes up quite a bit with Foster City. Uh, but because it's a clay soil, it's not prone to liquefaction. Having said that, though, it's prone to the uh, site amplification on soft soils that Anne Marie talked about. So it, it didn't get away scot free. Yeah, and, and, and settlement into those soft muds. Yeah. I wonder how we're doing, you know, 30,000 feet up with retrofitting of the public infrastructure. So. Are all of our bridges now safe? And then the water system, are the hospitals all now up to well, code? All you is know? a pretty high or, standard. Yeah. So, so I guess how close are we to? That's, you know, a, that's a good question. I don't know how close we are. I know uh, the large utilities, uh, San Francisco Public Utility, um, uh, East Bay Mud, uh, have invested large efforts in retrofitting and putting in uh, um, ser serious money in fixing the, the, the weak spots in the systems. Uh, I think Caltrans uh, uh, has finally finished. It took about 20 years uh, for that uh, money that was dedicated to retrofitting to be uh, um, actually uh, used, used up for the, uh, the, the retrofitting. But I, I, th I think with the Public infrastructure, we're do, we're doing uh, fairly well, fairly well. But having said that, you still have uh, vulnerable areas. For example, uh, a lot of the fills in the East Bay, um, you have pipes in liquefaction areas that uh, are probably going to have some surprises. Yeah. Thank you. I enjoyed your presentation very much. And having grown up in California, experienced most of the earthquakes, my question is with this early warning system, when it becomes operational for the public, um, you have 10, 20 seconds to react, and people will be in all kinds of different situations, be it at home, day, night, at work, travel, vacation, whatever. And it seems to me there's going to be, have to be a huge education about what to do in these 10 to 20 seconds, besides just go, 
oh my gosh, what do I do? You know, like I was treating patients in my office and it's like, what do I do? There's a patient here and you couldn't go under the table because it's a piece of machinery and go into the doorway or what do you do? And then the shaking stops. Okay. So I, my question is, there seems to be that it would have to be a big ramp up of public education in terms of specifically what they need to do in that short amount of time. Um, you can add to it if you want, but yeah, I mean, certainly public education is a large component of the Shake Alert project as a whole. There's a whole group within the project dedicated to that, and so it, that need is recognized, and um, as the system rolls out to the public, that's going to be part of the rollout. And I think what we would encourage right now is the same as if we didn't have earthquake early warning is to be prepared no matter where you are. So for most of us, maybe not if you're in a hospital setting or something, but for most of us, we actually are only in a few places on any one day, your house, your office, I don't know, maybe your gym or your car. So think about what would you do in those situations. So think right now, um, where would you go? So in this room, under the chair, under the table. So stop, drop, uh, stop, cover, hold on. Um, and, and just wait for shaking, and then when the shaking stops, come out. So if, if you do get an earthquake early warning, you should do the same thing. If you feel shaking without a warning, you should do that. I'd, I'd just add one observation that um, one of our seismologists was giving a, a talk on early warning, and he pointed out that you don't really need a cell phone or anything for an early warning, because if, if there's a big earthquake coming, you're gonna feel the P wave when it comes in. It, it's good it's going to be larger than anything you've probably felt before. And so that's sort of an, an alert. And uh, the shaking will come soon after that. Uh, and you will get the warning that way much sooner than you will with any uh, early warning system. So I think it's important, because we live in a place where earthquakes are to be expected, um, just when, you, when you're in a, a situation where there might be some hazard to you, you think about it. and. Uh, just have it become a natural instinct. So, I, I'll get you in a second. Yeah, first, thanks for coming out tonight. Enjoyed your talk. So, uh, two uh, questions, one very quick. What is the ground shaking? I saw in your graph it was, uh, it was sort of moderate, medium, et cetera, but I assume you have a more qualitative or quantitative, uh, you know, is that acceleration of the ground or how is that actually measured? Uh, the second question is probably maybe for all of you or anyone that wants to answer, what would you like, if you could get a grant, like, you know, for as much money as you wanted, or maybe not as much as you wanted, but like, what would be, what's, what's missing from your research now? What would you like to know um, going over the next 10, 10 years, maybe? Do, do you want to do the shaking? No, we'll let them so think about how they're going to spend their money. Yeah, so we typically measure the um, ground shaking in both acceleration and velocity and displacement, as Jessica mentioned. Um, and what um, we show in a lot of the products that I was showing is a um, intensity, which is a combination of acceleration and velocity. And we found that that combination of acceleration and velocity, some average of that, best represents what people and buildings perceive. So our intensity scale is actually built on how people perceive shaking and how buildings react to shaking. And then we've determined um, the combination of acceleration and velocity that best matches that when we talk about these products. Does anybody want to spend a lot of money? I would love to spend a lot of money. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I remember, I, I don't remember who said this, but um, you know, some scientists said basically we would like to have measurements everywhere all the time, um, which unfortunately we cannot do. But one place where y you may remember not having seen a lot of stations on our maps is offshore. Um, obviously there are faults offshore under the ocean. Um, and we would like to be able to get data there too, both for understanding hazard and um, potentially for, for warning, whether it be earthquake early warning or tsunami warning. Um, the Pacific Northwest is a place where there's a huge uh, hazard from the subduction zone faults there. And if we could get more observations um, from offshore, that would give us a lot of insight into what's happening there. So um, from my perspective, um, techniques for, for seafloor geodesy are really exciting. They are also extremely expensive. So if I had a lot of money, I would put some money towards that. <laughs>
I, I'm not going to give Dave a chance because he's, he's just going to say more trenching. <laughs> I have a question that was asked by children that I was working with, and I've had it myself. When I look at all these roughly parallel fault lines, I see an imaginary horizontal line that represents the Hetch Hetchy water supply. It, since it crosses almost all those faults, does that mean that it has almost a 76% chance of being damaged? And what happens? How does it get out of the bay? How does it get under the freeways so that it can survive this treacherous area? Yeah, that, that was one of the major um, efforts that uh, uh, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission addressed when they were assessing their vulnerability, the fault crossings. And so they, they, um, you, you can design pipes uh, to, yeah, that allow movement uh, across the fault coming in obliquely and that kind of thing. So they, they gave it a lot of thought and invested a fair amount of money in, in addressing that problem. So I don't think the um, major water lines like Hetch Hetchy are as much the problem as, as it is the distribution system because we you know, hit one of the mains in, in that and then that wipes out multiple neighborhoods. So. I was very impressed by the Channing House protection against earthquake faults. However, I live in the mid-century Eichler and nobody has addressed whether my lack of shear strength because of all the large windows is going to give me a lot of problems in an earthquake. Is there anything you can suggest I should be doing to protect myself? <laughs> Do we have an Eichler expert? <laughs> <laughs> I, I haven't thought about Eichlers. Generally, the lighter the structure, which Eichlers generally are, uh, the that's better right. because you don't have a lot of mass throwing around. So that, that's working in your behavior. Uh, Eichlers have a lot of wood paneling, which is a good thing. Uh, but they also have a lot of windows, which is not a good thing. Uh, Just get away from the windows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, stand next to the wall. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, thanks, oh. you guys. So I actually grew up here and went through all the earthquake drills, you know, growing up as a kid. And I was actually living in Europe when the earthquake hit, and I was actually a little disappointed. <laughs> I bet you there were more people who were disappointed that they didn't miss it, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, so my question for David is, um, on the one, you had that one uh, diagram uh, where you had the multiple uh, thrust faults, I think, uh, piled up to the right of the, of the uh, Loma Prieta uh, fault. And I was kind of curious, and you said they all started shaking. Was that like immediately when the, when the uh, fault hit? Or was it more delayed? The, uh, as far as we know, the, uh Triggered slip occurred at the time of the main earthquake, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a post earthquake phenomena. It wasn't creep, but it was they the compressional deformation was triggered by the shaking at the time of Loma Prieta. Okay, cool. Thanks, Jim. We're, we're going to go to the front row here, and then I'll get back to you. Thank you all for doing the presentation that you did. I'm a novice at all of this and came as a guest from him, well, with him. So if I say anything wrong, you can blame him. <laughs> I'm going to make a joke, then I'm going to make an unsubstantiated observation, and then I have a real question. My joke is, is my early warning, I thought, was a newly acquired dog about two years ago that I thought the dog was actually going to tell me when an earthquake happened. <laughs> Obviously, she didn't when it came to the coma earthquake that just happened a couple of, about a week ago. So I'm not going to put her out to pasture, but I'm definitely not going to like look at her when there's an expected earthquake. Um, the unsubstantiated observation was I've had the pleasure of growing up here in San Francisco, um, being here over, over a half a, half a century, half a century. Um, and used to when I, we were growing up, you know, part of our thoughts were when earthquakes happen is because there was a big, huge heat wave that came through, right? That was kind of the thought back then. Heat wave, okay, brace yourself in the next day or so, there's gonna be an earthquake. So that's the unsubstantiated observation. The question is, is and maybe this has a little bit to do with the, the guy in the White House, that talks about global warming and things of that nature affecting 
does it for earthquakes? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think there's going to be a major impact on earthquakes from, um, from climate change. It, if anything, maybe the sea level rise could change stresses a little bit. But I think what you're going to end up doing is just perturbing a system that's naturally being reloaded all the time. So may, maybe you'll change a few. Uh, an earthquake by a few days or something like that, but you're not going to substantially change the hazard. It's not going to increase the hazard. With the yeah. global warming and everything like that? That's no, because that, that's really a solid earth phenomena. Okay. Climate change is the liquid part. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sure. I mean, I think what you were really asking is, is there earthquake weather? And the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and we actually, we get this question a lot. So some, one of our colleagues actually ran the numbers and looked at all the patterns of temperature and humidity and all the things that we think are earthquake weather um, and the occurrence of earthquakes and there was no correlation. So um, yeah, we ran the data. And the other thing you, you asked about, the first part was can animals detect earthquakes? And they cannot predict earthquakes. They don't know what's going on in the earth. But uh, a lot of animals can be more sensitive to the high frequency early waves. So Tom was talking about feeling the P wave and he said, if we have a big earthquake, you'll feel it. But if there's a tiny earthquake like Colma, maybe your dog, well, your dog did, but <laughs> a dog could have felt the P waves coming in from a smaller earthquake that maybe you were um, jogging or washing the dishes or um, watching something really exciting on TV and you weren't paying attention, but your dog's just lying there, taking a nap, like, you know, waiting for something interesting to happen. So it's possible the dog did feel those first waves um, before you did. To what you had. Um, so just to echo what Emery said, there, there isn't such a thing as earthquake weather, but people have actually investigated, you know, are their stress changes due to changes in the hydrology near fault? So it's, it's not completely off the wall to, to think about that, but it's not something that we understand in a way that's predictive. And it's certainly not um, earthquake weather in the sense of it's hot today, so there's going to be an earthquake. But um, certainly uh, trying to understand the stresses on the faults is one branch of research that uh, we, we do pursue to try to understand what the hazard is. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is this working? Yeah. OK. Um, you can probably tell if you can read my shirt that I was delighted to see the curb offset slide that you showed uh, in the city of Hayward. Uh, I understand that some of our uh, very, very, very efficient city employees have actually fixed some of the items that were being uh, studied in Hayward. And with that humor in mind, uh, I'd like to know when you decide you're going to uh, pick a site and then study it over years, how do you make contact with the local um, community in terms of letting them know that you're doing that and that you will be coming back, and so on and so on. Well, there are, there are really different ways, and Jessica explained them, to measure, uh, say, creep on, on a fault. And uh, it's very dramatic when you go to a curb, and part of it is painted red, and part is uh, clear, and you see it's been offset this much. And then it's really uh, disheartening to go back and see the city has repaired it. And um, in the end, though, the fault always wins. So you're going to have your offset. I think, I think if you walk through downtown Hayward, uh, that's really sort of a nice urban setting for a strikes the fault, and uh, you can see the fault in the asphalt. You can see where it's deformed buildings. You can see where it's pulled buildings apart. You can see where the sidewalks used to be offset. And I mean, the city just has a program of trying to repair things. Um, we did talk to city officials in Hayward after they reset that famous uh, curb. And they said, well, we're sorry. We should have asked about it, but this was our plan. And um, I mean, I think it just sort of goes with the territory. Uh, but the critical places, 
the instruments to measure creep don't have to be, we don't really need that curb offset. We have much more precise measurements in, in other places. Um, that being said, it, it is, uh, if you remember back to, to my talk, um, especially looking back over decades, the places where we made measurements were typically at survey benchmarks, either ones that were installed for, for land surveying unrelated to science or ones that we specifically installed. And it's important to have the longevity of, of measurements over decades. And we do have a problem with, with benchmarks being vandalized. Um, so that's always unfortunate when, when we lose those data points. Uh, when there's a, permanent, a permanently installed station, um, typically we have a, a permit with the landowner and it has um, maybe fencing around it, depending on the location. There are different precautions taken to protect that site. And so uh, we, we feel more confident in general about those. But yeah, it's an ongoing problem that um, benchmarks get destroyed either by vandalism or by construction. Um, you know, any number of reasons. So, um, but that's, you know, we just do the best that we can with, with what we have. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got two questions. My name is Don Christian. I'll ask them independently. Uh, the first is you, you did a really good job of explaining these new technologies and the density of, of much better data that we have now. So my question is, has that had any perceptible effect on insurance? And specifically on uh, uh, either insurance rates, insurance coverage, insurance accuracy, um, uh, and and I realize this is not the uh, it, this is not a technical question. So anything that you've heard would be uh, appreciated. Yeah, yeah, I can answer that. The it's had a huge impact on insurance because the California Earthquake Authority that sells, I think, 80% of the uh, residential earthquake insurance um, actually uses the, the uh, models that uh, Dave was showing. Uh, well, in fact, the probabilities you see here. So the, the, whenever uh, the survey uh, issues one of these uh, probabilities, they uh, will update their uh, in, insurance to reflect the, uh, the, the, those estimates. So that's one of, one of the really important uses of, of this data. And I think, Dave, didn't uh, the, the authority actually fund some of the last probability study? The most recent uh, study, which was called USURF 3, or uh, as Jessica said, the Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast, so repeat that 10 times, um, that was funded to a very large degree by the California Earthquake Authority. And so, yeah, they use the probabilities and they use all of the data that go into calculating the probabilities in, uh, you know, reevaluating insurance rates for, you know, specific different areas. And I, I just add, there's um, se several companies that do earthquake loss estimation, and so the commercial sector uh, is, is taken care of by. Th those companies. So uh, really, and, and of course, they're going to be adopting the science because they get a marketing advantage if they can say the latest. So uh, th th this stuff actually gets used pretty quickly in the insurance industry, probably faster than it does in the, uh, uh, the code business, which takes a while to evolve. Right. So one follow-up question to that. Same question. What uh, have you seen as impact on um, urban development, land use, land values, uh, real estate. Yeah, I'll just make an observation from, from Loma Prieta. I, I was surprised, I did a lot of uh, um, walking the streets in uh, the Marina District after Loma Prieta. And uh, I remember talking to a realtor about what the impact on uh, uh, housing prices had, had been. and. Uh, the realtor really couldn't detect an impact from the earthquake. I, I don't know if you remember, we were actually in a little bit of a recession, and house prices actually declined a little bit due to that, and the realtor thought that was the primary impact. So my guess, it's, it's like uh, buying a house in, in the floodplain. Uh, it's such a small consideration in, in the purchase uh, that it, it just doesn't impact uh, housing values. Now. The added uh, uh, cost of making a home stronger 
you know, following codes and newer construction practice, that does add a few percents to the construction cost. So that's obviously going to be reflected in the price of the home. So that way it'll ha have an effect. But the hazard itself uh, doesn't seem to have, have much impact, in, at least in my experience. I live in the Sunset District of San Francisco, and it's on sand dunes. What are they like in terms of liquefaction, if anything? Uh, I think the state zones them as the, the, you have to do a special study in, in that area. But the dunes didn't show a lot of liquefaction in the 1906 oh. earthquake. So I, I, I think they're an old enough geologic deposit that um, liquefaction is probably not a big uh, problem, not like it is with the fills around the margins. Second question, in your haywire scenario, almost no mention of fire after earthquake, and that certainly in San Francisco was probably the biggest impact. Is USGS doing any studies to promote fire prevention after an earthquake? Did you want to talk about that? I'm not sure which chapter it is, and maybe, Steve, you want to say something about this, but uh, the issue of fire following earthquake is huge. Uh, it was really carefully looked at, uh, and there were some very, very stunning statistics that were developed by the Haywired study. Um, I don't know where that particular chapter is in terms of circulation. But here's the man who'll tell you. Oh, my name is Steve Hickman. I also work for the USGS. There's actually a fact sheet in the back of the room discussing the haywired scenario, and in the second volume, there's engineering implications. Fire following earthquake is one of those chapters. And the fire following earthquake is, of course, very important. It depends on the time of day. It depends on winds and various other things. But it is a significant factor. And, of course, the 1906 earthquake, there was a lot of fire damage from the fire after the earthquake was more damaging than the earthquake itself. So it is an important consideration. And fire departments around the Bay Area have taken this into account, into account in planning, having local water supplies trying to make their own sort of piping more resilient, and things like opening up firehouse doors as soon as you get an alert from earthquake early warning. These are the kind of things that are being done. But fire following earthquake is a big issue, and it is discussed in the haywired scenario. So. I'm sorry. Okay, and this is like novice kind of a question, but I live in an area in a hill area that, is, and our house is built on serpentine, and it's solid serpentine. My husband had to pickaxe out an area for some garden area. So, um, in the '89 earthquake, um, I was home watching a ball game. I thought. And I look out my window, I can see the bay, I didn't notice anything going on with the bay, but we have this huge, or had this huge, uh, some kind of a pine tree that looked like it was coming up out of the ground and going back down. Now this huge oak tree, same thing, but it wasn't quite as tall. And um, so, I actually saw that before I actually felt anything, but you were talking about P wave, and um, my daughter in her bedroom had a bunch of trophies, one on this wall, one on this wall. These all fell down, and these remain standing. So is that waves, or is that shaking, or is, I mean, is it the and the um, fall? I'm very close to Filoli, so the fault is like runs along. So, so you got to see Loma Prieta. I got to see it and feel it and hear it because it actually made noise. Yeah, so those are all the things you're describing are the same phenomenon waves shaking, that's the same thing. Um, so, yeah, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head that you experience um, the, the shaking waves coming through and they have different senses of motion. So if you have your daughter's trophies in this direction or this direction and the waves came through this way, they might affect some of them. So that's, that's very common that we hear stories like the wine glasses in this shelf completely shattered and in, in the shelf they didn't, you know, or, or even something much heavier shattered and the wine glasses were fine. Um, I, I don't know for sure about your, your trees, but trees do move 
in earthquakes. I don't know that they were uprooted or not, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are, um, there's a um, really nice example of some trees um, from, I think, the 1906 earthquake that were uprooted and turned over, but actually found their roots back in, and now they grew for a while um, when they were uprooted, so now they're horizontal, and they've started to grow back up vertically. So you can go uh, see those up on Page Mill Road. So yeah, root trees can get uprooted. Thank you. Uh, I was living in Tokyo in 95 when the Kobe quake hit, and we didn't feel much, but we, of course we watched it and I think 6,000 people died. My question is, how much do you interact with your colleagues around the world, Japan in particular, and how well are we prepared versus the Japanese or other you know, first world countries with earthquake issues? I'll take the first part. I think all of them would say a lot. Um, one of the nice things of working at the uh, survey, it, in the earthquake program is you do interact internationally with uh, with science. For the second part of your question, who would like to? <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make a comment from the geodetic perspective. Um, after the Kobe earthquake, they, they have installed a very extensive um, continuous GPS network, and that was um, far before far earlier than we did here. And so that's been something that we certainly have looked to in designing networks here. Um, and so they, they really put uh, priority on um, getting the best data collection that they could. And they continue to do that with new kinds of networks now. So, um, so they, they definitely are um, at the vanguard. I, I would say that um, we are not doing so badly here either. I, I'm not not to, to put ourselves down, but yeah, they're they're definitely um, you know, a, a country that prioritizes that kind of thing. And the, the building codes are similar or where are we where do we stand? No, I, I think we communicate with and interact with uh, foreign colleagues uh, at all levels. And uh, I know in my career, uh, I did a tremendous amount of work with uh, the Italian equivalent of the US Geological Survey, uh, with the Japanese equivalent of the US Geological Survey, uh, with uh, the Mongolian equivalent of the US Geological Survey. And uh, this sharing of information and actually working together in different places uh, is one of the best things that we can be doing. So communication internationally and domestically is absolutely critical to improving our science and our work for you. Your building code question is kind of interesting because um there is a lot of communication between the, the countries, but uh, very often the engineers in each country will have their own design bias. So for example, uh, Chile, which is a very uh, progressive uh, earthquake country, uh, they, they tend to build stiffer and more resistant uh, buildings. Uh, and I think that was true of Japan until, like during the Kobe earthquake, maybe the Hanshin Expressway fell over. Um, they, it was too stiff. So, uh, it, but, we, we learn from each other. Uh, there's a lot of exchange after earthquakes to look at what survived and what didn't. And, uh, but it is interesting that still the codes do have uh, sometimes not so subtle differences in terms of their uh, design philosophy. Yeah. Well, first we have to switch to metric to actually use the code. Yeah. <laughs> Question, I guess mostly for Jessica, but everybody else too. You mentioned your high speed GPS network and your synthetic aperture radar and your hope that we will get a good underwater uh, sensor network. Are there any other sensors that you see on the ground or in orbit, like the synthetic aperture radar that you'd like to see or that you know might be coming beyond that uh, synthetic aperture radar with the US and India in 2022? And specifically, did anybody in the survey get some ideas from some of the sensors that the Navy has at the China Naval Weapons Station during the study of the quake down there? Okay, so um, 
In terms of satellite-based sensors, uh, I think, so the U.S. has been, been trying for a long time to launch a SAR satellite um, for scientific purposes, and so I, I think my, my first hope is that that um, just gets launched and uh, we can start um, really benefiting from those data. Um, we we have collected a lot of, of data on the ground at China Lake. Uh, I don't have a lot of information, and if I did, I probably wouldn't be allowed to say it, as to what kind of sensors they have there. Um, but we, our, our field crew went to China Lake and collected a lot of um, the GNSS data and mobile laser scanning data on the ground there. And, um, you know, that's, um, you know, every time we have a major earthquake, it's another opportunity to get really unprecedented measurements. Uh, so things like the mobile laser scanning and new techniques for using the data from the SAR satellites are really enabling us to map um, the, the surface offsets in very high detail. And that's something that's giving us some new insights into how the slip during an earthquake um, manifests itself when it reaches the, the surface of the Earth, and, and that's very important for understanding hazard because when you go back to look at earlier ruptures, you want to understand, okay, if I see this amount of offset in a trench or with a, a stream channel, what does that represent um, for a slip on the fault as a whole? So um, those are, are some examples of, of what we're doing. I don't know yeah. if others have more to add to that. So I know you guys have invested a huge amount of uh, instrumentation in Parkfield, and I always understood that you were looking for like another uh, six or six plus earthquake there, and just instrument the crap out of it and get a good data set. I heard that that has never really happened. You've never gotten a good quake there. One, is that right? And two, was all that investment worth it? Did it pay off? Um, so. We, we did have an earthquake there of magnitude 6 in 2004, and that was after a lot of instrumentation had been put in. Um, so we did get a lot of good data from that earthquake, and uh, we were able to answer some of the questions that, <laughs> that we had posed um, leading up to that. Uh, but it, like every earthquake, it had some surprises, too. You know, it was, it was not a carbon copy of ones before it. And that in and of itself is interesting because a lot of models had pointed to the similarities among the previous magnitude 6 earthquakes there in developing sort of a framework for understanding um, earthquakes that might repeat themselves, and, and indeed, the 2004 earthquake had its own sort of unique qualities. So, um, so yeah, it was it was certainly worth it, and um, we did get a lot of good data from that earthquake. And is the effort continuing? We do continue to have instrumentation there. Um, some of the instruments that were installed there in the the Parkfield experiment uh, are no longer functioning, but there are new instruments that um, have been installed since. So we have certainly a lot of um, seismic instrumentation, geodetic instrumentation there. Okay, thanks. Hmm. Th th thanks for a wonderful evening. Uh, there's a map on the screen behind you. Uh, how, how many seismometers are there on that map and how many GPS units? Uh, sorry, I know I skipped the slide where I showed that. Uh, maybe a couple hundred seismometers on this map. Um, I don't know, something like that. Hundred to three hundred, maybe on this map. Steve's nodding yes. Three hundred, three hundred, four hundred. All right, in that <laughs> quite a, quite a few. Um, and and we're continuing to to deploy more and more. And like Jessica said, I think maybe. What a lot of us would wish for with more money is just more and more and more and more sensors. So every every ten meters. <laughs> um, I see some of your GPS units occasionally alongside the road, how, but I have no idea how many there are out there. So in the area covered by this map, I, I would just have to take a ballpark guess of something like between 50 and 100 of the continuous GPS stations. Um, the ones that you see, there, there are a few places, for example, along 101, um, where you can see them from the road. And those, uh, many of them are operated by uh, um, a consortium called UNAVCO. And it's part of what was 
um, developed as the Plate Boundary Observatory, and now it's been incorporated into um, what they call the Network of the Americas, which includes actually GN GNSS networks in Mexico and the Caribbean as well. So, um, so those ones are probably the most visible. There are a couple in open space preserves in this area, and like you said, along roadsides too. Do you put do you put pairs of GPS stations in on? sort of next to you on opposite sides of the fault? Um, there are a few examples of that. It's not the most typical way that we deploy them. Um, we have other ways of measuring fault creep that happens near the surface that um, are more cost effective, but so we rather try to um, distribute the, the continuous GPS stations more broadly over the area. Um, but one thing that we're trying to do more of is to co-locate the GNSS with seismic instrumentation because using the two data types together can be really powerful. Thanks. I'm, I'm getting a sign from Amelia that she has to go rescue her babysitter, so we'll just do one more question. Okay, this is uh, two really quick little questions. One, one uh, on behalf of my wife. What, was the, uh, what, what were the uh, marshmallows made out of? In, <laughs> in the in the parking lots of the of the Channing House, it, it, it's it's a uh, polymer that's specially um, made for these. Um, uh, it, they're called base isolators, mm -hmm. and uh, that they you, you don't want them to shred, mm -hmm. so they have to be pretty strong, and they have to be uh, um, uh, very plastic, so they'll they'll move as well. So. Yeah. Uh, they can be any size; they can be huge. It depends on the 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 structure, yeah, no, they're, they're feet across, yeah. And the other thing I was curious about, I, I look at the earthquake maps uh, sometimes, and and it, it seems like there's one every day around in uh, in the pinnacles. They're they're really small, but they happen almost every day, and right there. We have a pinnacles ex expert. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the San Andreas is a little. What to the west or east? East, of the, yeah, the east of the Pinnacles. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't know what the okay. fault is down there. <laughs> yeah, and we don't get to the Pinnacles there. So. No. <laughs> um, oh, we we have a local expert, John Tinsley, has been to the Pinnacles. Uh, yeah, the the Pinnacles are one of the. Uh, uh, key points for establishing long-term, huge horizontal movements on the San Andreas. The uh, the other half of the pinnacles is the Nenach Volcanics uh, down by uh, uh, the uh, the Grapevine area, uh, and and this was a Miocene volcanic complex and lahar system that got split by the San Andreas. Um, and so you're, you've got the San Andreas itself just a kilometer or three to the east of, of the Pinnacles proper. And uh, as usual, there's more than one fault there. So uh, no problem accounting for earthquakes there. And though there, there will be others. There, there is a button on that menu that enables you to turn on the faults. So yeah, you can see if it's the San Andreas there. Or not. So, well, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming here. It's been a great audience.